Okay, well, welcome. Uh, my name is John Mazzara with Remax Results. Uh, thank you for coming today. I'm going to introduce my agent, my insurance agent. It's Aaron Nicolay with Farmers, and uh, he is a fantastic agent. That's why I have him here today. He's going to speak to the importance of having the right policy for a rental property, and as a landlord, things that you can do to protect yourself. And uh, with that, I'm just we're going to have a kind of a conversation, and Aaron's going to talk, and uh, I'll interject. Uh, where I have questions uh, you know, that I want further clarification on. So with that, Aaron, tell everybody who you are, how they can reach you, and, and we'll just kind of take it from there. Well, and thanks, John. Appreciate you uh, having me on here, and, and hopefully I can provide some educational and value to the, to the whole experience. Um, I've been an insurance agent for uh, 10 years now. Um, I started my agency in, in 2011. Um, I had a pretty strong background in, in prior careers with uh, risk uh, management and mitigation, and so this was um, a great opportunity for me to uh, do that and and to own my own business, um, which was uh, which was important to me. I, I grew up in a family business, and and uh, I wanted to to get back to that place again. So um, we've been doing this for again about ten years. Um, I've got uh, a couple of part time staff uh, who uh, work for me, and, uh, and and we're based in Eden Prairie. Um, it's uh, the Necklay Agency Farmers Insurance. That's N I C K L A Y. And uh, you can give us a call anytime, 952-229-5155. And uh, it forwards to our cell phones. And so we're, we're always somewhere that we can, we can be found, so. Excellent, excellent. Well, Aaron, if, if I was to go buy an investment property and, and tell you that I bought one, um, what type of a policy would you initially recommend or what would, you, what would be the first thing that I would do? Well, if, uh, and, and you and I have had this conversation before, and, and typically the first questions that I have, you know, I, I want to kind of find out what kind of property are we working with. Um, you know, a landlord policy for a single family home or, or a fourplex or a duplex is, is very different from the, uh, the landlord policy that we're going to write on a condo or townhome. Um, and, and of course, you know, the major difference there is, is that uh, with townhomes and condos, we're working with uh, and have to dovetail our policy um, with, with the landlord policy with the master policy that the homeowners association carries. And it's very important to make sure that we do that. Um, with, with a standalone property, whether it's you know one or two or four units, um, we need to go ahead and make sure that we've got everything on, on your landlord policy. Um, and, and so it's, uh, it's just a different set of, of challenges that we need to make sure that we've uh, covered all our bases. Um, but but the type of property is the, the first and foremost thing that I want to find out about what it is we're going to be insuring. Okay. And then, uh, with regards to like liability and lost rents and things like that and vandalism, uh, can you kind of go over that and how those Absolutely. maybe a BOP difference from fire dwelling from a some of the other policies and with it regards to master hazards and sure thing so there's some uh, there's some common themes you know it doesn't matter what kind of a property that we're going to be insuring and, and what kind of policy that we end up writing but um, first and foremost uh, we want to make sure that we cover property uh, you know you have bought a, a tangible real property asset and we want to make sure that if something happens that that asset is put back into its original condition uh, and, and uh, in order to do that we want to make sure that we have all the proper coverages it's a standalone house we're going to go ahead and say, well, what's the cost to reconstruct this thing? If, if, if it's burned to the ground and we got to scoop the debris out and then build it all new, that's what we want to make sure we have covered. Um, if it's a homeowners association uh, situation where they're going to go ahead and, and uh, take care of the, the structure itself, we still want to make sure that we can go ahead and put back uh, the interior features. Um, if you know, if you've upgraded your countertops and your your cupboards and and all of those things on the inside that make it a uh, an attractive rental, then, then we want to make sure that after the reconstruction is done and the homeowners association's master policy has done its thing, that we can then go and make sure that the, the, the finer points are taken care of and, and uh, that you end up with exactly or, or better uh, than you had before the incident. So that's first and foremost, regardless of what kind of policy we're writing, that's our primary concern. Beyond that, uh, every single landlord policy is going to include some coverages for things like loss of rent. And, and loss of rent uh, uh, simply provides you with uh, a check uh, every month uh, that, uh, that you would otherwise have received from your tenants after a claim. And so, uh, for example, a couple of years ago here, I had a client that uh, had a, a, a terrible ice dam situation in the spring. We had uh, a perfect situation where where uh, ice dams formed uh, literally in hours and, and uh, started 
putting water into homes and uh, his rental was significantly uh, damaged. The homeowners association was not very quick to respond. And at the end of the day, he ended up having to move his renters out of his um, townhome um, during the duration of the rebuilding. And, and during that time, of course, he was not collecting rent. And, and so um, we were able to go ahead and write him a check once a month. And, and unfortunately, with the complication of the, the homeowners association master policy, it took a few months. And so he could potentially have been out, um, I think, uh, all said and done, it was going to be close to $8,000. Um, and, and, and of course, you know, as especially if you're just starting out as a landlord, uh, you're relying on that money to, to make, you know, your your payments, uh, you know, to you know, your mortgage on, on the taxes, on the insurance. Um, these are things that, that, you know, you need to have cash flow in order to make. And so uh, that loss of rent becomes very, very important. Um, all policies will kind of default to a certain percentage. Um, I have a tendency to kind of bump those up a little bit. And uh, it's just because nothing ever gets fixed as fast as we would like it to. So um, we do have a, 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 a lot of options for liability. Um, liability is extremely important. Um, liability really comes into play when somebody gets seriously hurt. And, and uh, when somebody gets seriously hurt, um, that usually means that there's going to be some, some significant expenses for them. And uh, there's a tendency, uh, good or bad, uh, for people to go ahead and just start uh, lining up all of the people that are involved. If you touch the situation in any way, even if there was no involvement that you had in causing this event to happen, uh, they will list you on the lawsuit. And, and so having um, that liability coverage in place protects you. And, and you know, worst case scenario is if, if you were to be found liable and, and, and a judgment was made, then that liability coverage provides you know, a payout so that you know, if you get uh, if you get assessed five hundred thousand dollars because you didn't fix a front step, you know the way that maybe some court thought that you should. Well, then you know we're going to go ahead and write that check for that five hundred thousand dollars. In addition, we're going to do some uh, work to help you uh, defend on on that uh, particular lawsuit because obviously we have a vested interest in making sure that um, we mitigate that loss. So uh, liability is very very important um, for landlords. Uh, I will uh, typically uh, recommend half a million to a million dollars in liability. Um, it seems like a lot. Um, it's not really very expensive. You know, I can go from uh, half a million dollars of liability on a policy to a million dollars of liability on a policy. We're going to spend an extra 40 bucks a year. And so it's, it's extremely affordable. And so it's, it's easy to recommend. Beyond that, there's, uh, there's a, a lot of different ways to go ahead and make sure that we've covered uh, what you you know, have for a property, uh, depending upon the property. Um, if, uh, if, you know, if, if it's in a location like, say, Minneapolis, where um, we have some concerns about uh, the sewer and water system um, just being old and, and occasionally breaking, um, you know, sewer and drain or service line coverages may be important. Um, make sure that if something does end up in the basement that you can go ahead and deal with it. Um, and, and we also may want to take a look at um, if you have uh, separate structures. Um, you know, if, if you've got a a, um, a garage that's detached and, uh, and that uh, garage is not necessarily something that we're going to rebuild for 12,000 bucks. We want to make sure that we appropriately um, cover that. And so um, it's, it, it's all very personable. Uh, you know, we, can, we can personalize the, the coverages to make sure that it fits your property. Um, HOAs, uh, as I said before, kind of present a little bit of a challenge, but it's, it's not something that can't be overcome. Um, typically, I would just call down and talk to the management company and to the, uh, the agency that writes the master policy to find out, you know, what are their limits? What are the exclusions? What are the deductibles? Um, and then that way I can get to dovetail your policy um, together with that. Uh, again, I'm, I'm very conservative in that uh, I've unfortunately seen uh, HOAs uh, and, and master policies that maybe haven't done what they should have done in, in certain situations. And, and so, um, if, if we have, uh, if we, uh, if we set up a coverage for loss assessment, um, which is, you know, what would pay from your policy, if, uh, the homeowners association came back and said, Hey, listen, we had to file a claim and here's your share of the deductible. Um, if, if they say, well, you know, it's, it's $5,000 deductible, I'm probably going to tell you to put it at like 10 and, and same thing with building property. And you know, I'm just going to go ahead and recommend that we go a little bit higher. So, that, you know, probably I'd recommend 15 or 20, um, Sometimes, uh, and, and you and I have run into this before, uh, after talking to a management company uh, in, a, in, a, in a master policy uh, 
uh, company, I'll, I'll recommend that we go even higher. Um, frankly, we all know that there are uh, there are good management companies and good insurance companies, and that there are ones that um, you know maybe are less so. And and so really kind of being able to gauge who we're working with so that we can protect ourselves is is really kind of what I'm looking for. Um, because at the end of the day, regardless of the property and and what happens, uh, my goal is is that. Uh, when you call me because you've had an event happen and we need to file a claim, I want it to go as smoothly and cleanly as possible and for you to be as happy as you can possibly be at the end of that process. Uh, there's nothing worse for, for me or for you as a landlord than to have there be any kinds of delays or problems or issues or uh, not optimal uh, payouts at the end of the day. And so this right here, the, the part where we really design the policy is the part where we make sure that we're not having problems later. Awesome. What about vandalism? Uh, is vandalism generally covered or do I need to add that on as a separate rider? Uh, vandalism is, is typically covered. The only time that uh, I do run into uh, making sure that we do add vandalism as a rider is if you end up with a property that's vacant for a while. Vacant properties uh, here in Minnesota require a different kind of policy. Um, and, and really that's, you know, if you're a landlord or, or your personal home, um, if, if you move out or if your renters move out, and it's vacant for more than 30 days, um, we need to go ahead and write it over to a vacant policy. Um, and, and, and in that case, we would want to add a vandalism rider just to make sure that if, you know, the local kids broke in and had a kegger and, and uh, you know, tore the place up a little bit, we'd have coverage for it. Um, but on a traditional landlord policy, um, vandalism is already included. And so it's not something that we need to add. Okay. I never even thought about that on a um, rental, if it's vacant, that's vacant. Yes, I think about yeah. that when I'm selling a home, but I had never connected that really right now. Yeah, and really it, it, uh, it, it comes into play at times when people don't necessarily think about it. Um, you know, renters move out and you decide it's time to go ahead and do a, a little bit of work or refresh. And, and by the time the work is done and then you get new renters in there, well, it's been 60 days. Um, and, and that's just kind of, um, it's just not something that you think, oh, hey, a guy, I should call my insurance agent <laughs> because that's nobody's first thought anytime. Uh, but uh, but but it, it's the kind of time when we need to go ahead and just uh, be cognizant of our time frames and, and making sure that we're going to go ahead and, and have the right policy in place at the right time. Great point. Uh, regarding liability, I know we talked a little bit about the 500 and the million now. If somebody carries a personal umbrella policy, how many properties can that be extended to? And is that in addition to the base policy? Or is that you, before you can write it, do you require, let's say a million dollar umbrella, do you require a certain amount of underlying and then is it a million plus that underlying or does it does it equal a total of just a million? Sure, great question. So uh, umbrella policies are, are something that we can write uh, regardless of, of the situation. And so, uh, for example, I have clients who they've purchased landlord you know, investment properties that, that they rent and, and they're they're in their name. And, and so um, I have you know, their home and cars and, and the boat and whatever else. And then I also have a landlord policy on, you know, one or two or three properties. Uh, and, 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 and in all of those cases, I recommend an umbrella policy. Umbrella liability policies just add an additional layer of coverage. Um, and, and so you referenced, you know, kind of the, the underlying, um, the underlying liability is what you have on the policy. So if you got $500,000 on your uh, condo that you rent out, then that's $500,000 in liability. If something were to happen that was so terrible that uh, we ran through that $500,000, that's when an umbrella becomes really important because the umbrella then kicks in at when that $500,000 is, uh, is, is exhausted and, and it provides coverage up to the limit that we've set. And, and I can do a $1 million umbrella, uh, two, three, four, five, up to 10. Uh, and, and in cases where, um, the property is, is a significantly higher value. For example, we're seeing a lot of these uh, three, four, five story uh, apartment buildings, you know, luxury apartment buildings going up. Uh, those kinds of a, a landlord situation usually end up with, uh, you know, an umbrella policy that's, you know, 10, 15 or 20 million. Uh, but, it's, but it's something I can write on top of, um, you know, even just one property. Um, the, the, the challenge is, is that, uh, um, it, every umbrella ends up being a little bit different. Um, 
in that, uh, you know, writing a personal umbrella for, for you, for example, uh, you know, I've already got your auto and your home and all those kinds of things. And so we just tuck it right in under that, that uh, umbrella that we have on your personal and just the landlord is there as well. Um, when, when people uh, buy an investment property and they put it into say an LLC or, or a, an S corp or something like that, well, it's a business policy at this point. And so we would write uh, a business policy, a uh, business landlord policy, um, which is very similar to you know, a personal landlord policy. Uh, and, and we would have a business umbrella. Um, and, and so in those cases, I, I would end up recommending, you know, if, if you were to do that, for example, I'd say that, you know, John, you've got you know, auto and home and, and, uh, and you've got an umbrella. If, if you had a, an LLC that housed rental units, um, and, and that's where you kind of had them all parked and they were all deeded to that LLC. I would say, you know, we should have a business owner policy that provides basic liability and, and property coverage for those properties, but we should also have a business uh, umbrella. And, and so you would have two umbrellas. They would cover separate entities, you being one entity and the LLC being the second. Um, okay. Umbrellas are great though. I, I can't recommend it enough. Um, in, in, in part because sometimes you do, uh, you know, go beyond your, your base liability, but also because they do offer some different coverages. Um, first and foremost is, is that uh, when you have an umbrella claim, when, when we know that we're going to go ahead and end up in that umbrella, um, we have a, an umbrella legal team that gets involved and, and they're very good and they're, they're very aggressive and, and they're really looking to go ahead and make sure that we can mitigate this as much as possible. Um, they also uh, they also provide coverage that you wouldn't necessarily find on your base policy. Um, and and uh, you know the best examples I have are, you know I've had clients that were uh, sued for for uh, accidents that actually were completely not their fault. The liability was entirely on the other party, but but somebody sued them. And, and as soon as uh, they they had that lawsuit show up on, on their doorstep, usually presented by a, a friendly sheriff's deputy. Uh, and, and it was for more than what their baseline uh, liability is, then all of a sudden we would have our umbrella team get involved. And uh, in, in those kinds of a nuisance situations, um, the umbrella uh, team really makes it go away very quickly. So it's, it's, uh, it's just a, a, a nice, comfortable, warm blanket to have on top of all of your other stuff. Excellent. And is there a limit? Like if I have an umbrella, how many properties? I mean, it would it cover me on my oh. house? home and auto, but let's say I had three rental properties. Would it cover me and all three or do I have to get three umbrellas? Nope, absolutely not. We get one umbrella and we put everything underneath. And so that's the nice thing is, is that we really only need the one policy. Uh, we can continue to add units to it. And, uh, and there's no you know, limit on the number of units. Um, you know, as you add more things, uh, I tend to recommend uh, increasing that limit. And so, you know, if you've got one or two landlord uh, policies and then, you know, your personal stuff, uh, you know, a million, maybe two million would be uh, appropriate. Uh, I think, you know, once we get up to, you know, three, four, five rental units, uh, I'm going to start recommending that that we get into the three, four, five million dollar umbrella. And it's just uh, an unfortunate reality. Um, uh, when somebody looks at filing a lawsuit, they're going to take a look at your assets and that information is available out there. And, and they're going to uh, they're going to you know, file that lawsuit with a dollar amount on it that is based less on what happened and more on what your uh, net assets and, and, and worth are. And, and that's just kind of the reality of it. And so we're looking to put uh, coverage in place that, that reflects that reality. And so that, that way you never have to write a check. Excellent. Uh, I had a question about, uh, let's say you bought a home or a or multifamily unit that happened to have a sidewalk in front of it. And let's say the tenant was supposed to do the snow removal and they didn't, or even if they did, somebody wiped out and then you got a lawsuit. Now, who's liable for that? Uh, I assume since I would own the property, I would be. And then would my umbrella cover me or am I kind of SOL at that point? They will, uh, they'll name everybody. They'll name you, they'll name your tenant and they'll name the city. And, oh. uh, and, and that's just kind of the reality of the situation. Um, at, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you've got a, a contract rental agreement that says that the tenant is supposed to be going ahead and taking care of that. Uh, and, and of course, especially here in Minnesota, you know, we're, 
we're constantly concerned about these slip on ice kind of situations. And we've all heard of those things ending up in court. Um, but, but I can tell you that one of the first questions that gets asked, you know, when we start doing depositions is, uh, you know, how long have you lived here in Minnesota? Oh, 20 years. And, and uh, so, you know, we've had some rough winters there. Oh yeah, so you know ice is slippery, right? And that's kind of the line of question that we go down. Um, it doesn't mean that you're not gonna end up having to pay out. Um, but, but what we're doing is we're, we're kind of trying to keep it down to a dull roar. Um, it, in a situation like that, uh, somebody is gonna pay out uh, and, and more than likely it's gonna be uh, a little bit of everybody. Um, you know, the tenant is primarily responsible by you know, virtue of the contract you have with them that that was their responsibility. But as a property owner, you're gonna end up with a little bit of responsibility as well. And that's, that's where an umbrella can come in extremely handy, not only from the legal defense team, but also just if we end up having to write a check that, that exceeds the, the liability that we have on the property policy, that the umbrella policy will then go ahead and cover it. So. What about uh, the tenant having a tenant's policy, which is, I think, a good requirement of any landlord anyway. It's a um, must. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then what would you recommend? So that, that situation that we just talked about, how, how, what limits would you put in or what, what in the tenant policy would you require so that you knew as the landlord that if they were not acting responsibly and there was some liability that it could at least be deflected onto them them and their policy sure. versus me and mine? Absolutely. So uh, I, I do strongly recommend to all landlords that uh, prior to handing out the keys that they present evidence that they have a renter's insurance policy in place. Uh, on themselves and that it have uh, liability minimums. Um, now, a lot of times when you go to say uh, an apartment building, I, I have a lot of clients that they'll rent an apartment and they come back and they say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm required to have this, can we get this? And, and the requirement is for $100,000, which is uh, in my opinion, not high enough. And, and so really what I tend to recommend to uh, my, my, my landlord clients is, is that you really want them to have a $300,000 uh, liability limit on, on their renter's insurance policy. Okay. Uh, many renter's insurance policies uh, won't go any higher than five. And so the, the challenge is if you start trying to ask for them to have more, they may struggle to find somebody that will write it. Um, that being said, it's it's still not very expensive. You know, I can write a renter's insurance policy for with a hundred thousand in liability, and for an, you know another five bucks, I can go to three hundred, and for wow. another, you know ten, I can go to five hundred. It it it's not. Uh, it's not something that I think any landlord should be concerned that they're placing some kind of an undue financial burden on their tenants by asking for it. Just be aware that, um, you know, if they're with um, some companies that uh, maybe they found online um, that their their liability options for limits may be limited. And, and so you might have to help guide them a little bit to, to find an insurance agent that could help them out with something a little higher. But yes, if they've got something and, and they were contractually obligated to uh, to uh, take care of it, like the sidewalk situation, or even if somebody got hurt inside the the, the home. You know, they they had their cousin Billy Bob over, and and uh, Billy Bob fell down the stairs, and uh, well now you know he's got uh, some medical issues, and, and again he'll name everybody. You know, the, he'll name his friend, and he'll he'll name you. Um, that the renter's insurance policy can go ahead and, and uh, take the primary position on this particular. Uh, uh, lawsuit because you know he was in the home he was a guest there he hurt himself and and that that can be you know first place you you still have all your policies to protect you because like i said they will name you and the tenant will try and say that well you know that stair was loose or something like that but uh, but but yes we should require a renter's insurance policy of all of our uh, tenants and, and we should uh you know set it like i said three hundred thousand dollars in liability is, is a i think a good limit for them to have what if I wanted to pay for it and said, you know what, I, that way I know it's being taken care of and not canceled. Am I, as the landlord, able to say, uh, you know, the cost of the policy is whatever you'll tell me here in a moment, approximately. And, you know, when you rent from me, you have to make the application, but I'm going to pay it and maintain it uh, and be listed on there as a, you know, a, an insured interest or lost payee of some sort. Am I able to do that and pay that premium? Uh um, Yes, in certain circumstances, and, and I'll explain that. Um, it, I have many, many uh, students uh, who come to me and say, hey, I, I'm getting uh, some, uh, some student housing down at the U of M, and I need to have this, uh, this policy in place. Otherwise, by, by the terms of the lease uh, that they signed for their, their student housing, um, that the, uh, you know, the, 
management company, whoever the U is contracted, is going to go ahead and obtain coverage for them. And, and so they've got a company they work with that just, you know, writes these little renter's insurance policies, uh, you know, a dime a dozen. Uh, but, but you have to give them that option. You have to say, either you get it or I'll get it for you. You, know, you can't force them to take yours. Um, however, uh, you know, if you go ahead and, and do want to take out a policy, if, you know, the renter just won't or doesn't or whatever, uh, it, it's not expensive. You know, it's, it's 125 bucks a year, you know, for a renter's insurance policy. And so it's, it's a pretty cheap insurance to go ahead and have peace of mind. Um, and, and so, yes, you could go ahead and do that. Um, alternately though, uh, and, and I think that, you know, you mentioned this is a great idea. If you have uh, a renter that's coming in and they say, well, no, I'll get my own renter's insurance. Uh, you can ask to be listed on there as an additional insured. And, and uh, when, when somebody comes to me and, and asks for that, um, there are many kinds of additional insureds. Um, probably the one that, you know, we're most familiar with is, is a lien holder, a mortgagee. You know, you, mortgagees are just listed, you know, because you owe them, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars for a property. They're an additional interest. But there are other kinds. And so we can go ahead and we can list an additional interest as, as, a, as a rental management company. And that way, you know, you're absolutely correct. If that renter were to go ahead and in a month down the road say, ah, I don't need this. That guy's just uh, just hassling me and making me pay out more money than I need to. And he cancels his renter's insurance policy. If you're listed as an additional insured, you'll be notified. And you'll know that that renter's insurance is now out of force and that uh, you can then go ahead and say, hey, you know, the terms of your lease require this. And so you need to get this back and forth. Or you know, hey, listen, you're in violation of the terms. And so I'm going to obtain one for you. It's going to be added on to your, to your rent per the agreement that we have. And, and uh, if you decide to go ahead and get your own again, let me know. I just need a declarations page. And then I can go ahead and, and drop mine that I got for you and, and lower your rent back down to the uh, previously agreed amount. So it's, it's something I also recommend. It, uh, it, it isn't always feasible, but, uh, but, but most of the time it is, and it's a good idea. Awesome. That was excellent. Um, Aaron, is there anything else you can think about? I know, I mean, you've been very thorough and uh, what, what else can you think about that a, a potential landlord or an existing landlord uh, might be missing uh, with regards to their properties or they should, they should definitely, you know, consider doing uh, anything, any other tips that you can suggest uh, insurance wise? Well, I, there, there aren't a lot, but uh, but I think probably the most important thing that I can communicate to to any kind of a, a landlord property manager person is is that uh, from an insurance standpoint, um, the best claim is one that you've avoided. Uh, you know, claims regardless of how good your policy is uh, are still um, there's, they're still going to cost you money and, and they're still going to cost you time and, and they're, they're going to be stressful and, and there's no way around that. The best policy and the best agent in the world can't avoid that middle of the night phone call and that, that uh, horrible feeling in your gut that, uh, you know, now you have this issue that has to be dealt with. And so, uh, my, my strongest recommendation to, to all the landlords is, is just to really make sure that you're doing your due diligence to, uh, drive by your property frequently and just, uh, you know, look around to make sure that everything's good. Schedule opportunities uh, for you to go over and visit with your tenants. And, and uh, you know, certain tenants can feel like you're checking in or, you know, looking in on them or something like that. But phrased correctly, um, it becomes a, hey, listen, I just want to make sure that there's nothing here that, uh, that I need to go ahead and, and fix for you guys. I want to make sure that you've got the, the best possible, uh, you know, home to live in. And, uh, and, and so I just want to check out some things and, and I'm going to take some measurements because we might be doing some upgrades and, and just to do that, you know, once, twice a year, um, it, it'll, it'll help you to head off problems that uh, I, I, I'm not saying that renters would, you know, purposely not say anything to you, but, but they don't own the property. They don't have a vested interest in something. And so when we don't have vested interest in something, our tendency is to not really kind of you know, pull on that thread at 11 o'clock at night when you notice some little thing. Um, a property owner, you know, would. And, uh, and so just doing a regular inspection, making sure everything's as it should be, making sure that anything that does come to light uh, is, is addressed immediately um, and, and thoroughly. Uh, those are the things that I think that are most important in just avoiding a claim altogether. 
and uh, like I said, it avoids uh, you know having a, some expense and and stress and, and time loss that uh, that nobody needs. So, excellent. And then, uh, I know Aaron and I, you 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 and I met uh, a number of years ago, and I had been with another company for over twenty some years, and I thought incorrectly that I had the appropriate coverage. And you you had offered to do an analysis for me, you know, at, at no charge to see if I really did have everything covered. And uh, after we met, you know, you took about two, you know, took a very long amount of time with me to go through everything that I had. And you pointed out a number of things that were not adequately covered that I wasn't aware of. I thought I was aware of it, but I only know what I know. And sure. I'm not, and I'm not a PC guy. I don't know that. And you do. So if somebody was watching this right now and they're like, well, I think I got it all under control, but um, you know, again, they, they would be like me. I'm with, with somebody for 20 years and I, I think I'm adequately taken care of, but boy, when I found out I wasn't and I found out the other person had, had left me exposed, I, was, I immediately made that switch and I've never looked back and I recommended you to everybody. You're the only guy I recommend. So uh, if they wanted you know, to get in touch with you, for let's say a second opinion or just to get established, uh, is that something that you're open to do and is there a cost and how would they reach you to do that? Sure, absolutely. Well, and, and it's been a pleasure working with you guys. I, I, uh, I, I can't say enough good things about you, know, you or Patty and, and I recommend you guys a lot and, and you guys are my only recommendation there as well. Um, and and, uh, and I, I was very happy that we were able to find some, some opportunities to, to protect you guys better and, and, and save you some money. Um, and, and I'm happy to go ahead and do that analysis for anybody. I sit down frequently with people and, and really go through, okay, well, here's what you got and, and here's what I think you need and here's why. Um, and here's some of the op other options and, and the good and the bad. Um, different insurance companies have different uh, things that they do. And, uh, and, and I, I, um, I, I can tell you about you know, all of them. Um, you know, we're, we spend a lot of time in continuing education. We spend a lot of time working with our colleagues and so, you know, uh, we're pretty up to date on, on you know, the, the good, the bad, and, and uh, we can make recommendations on those stuff. If it's a situation where I'm just not going to go ahead and, and provide, you know, better coverage and cost savings for you, then I'm going to go ahead and tell you that, um, you know, and I've got a couple of clients you know, here recently that I did, um, and, and I, I wish them good luck, and, uh, but, but I'm happy to have made the recommendation, um, and, and I think that they walked away from the conversation uh, you know, much better educated. Which is which is my goal, um, and and so yes, if anybody wants to sit down, just go through their policies, see how it stacks up and compares. Listen to my recommendations. I'm happy to do that. Um, it doesn't cost a thing. Um, I'm happy to spend the time. Um, you know, as as you know, you and I are doing now. At, you know, video conferencing is easy, but uh, but but certainly we can schedule time to come into the office or or get on the phone. Whatever's you know going to work best. Um, phone number uh, you know again is nine five two 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 nine. 5155. Uh, otherwise, if you go out to uh, uh, Google and, and, and pull up uh, Aaron Necklai uh, out in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, uh, Farmers Insurance, uh, it'll pop up and you can communicate through my website or, or my Facebook page. Um, otherwise, uh, you can certainly email me uh, and that uh, email address is A-N-I-C-K-L-A-Y at farmers, F-A-R-M-E-R-S, agent.com. And uh, whatever way you're most comfortable with, we're happy to work with. Awesome, awesome. And then just one last thing, Aaron. So uh, you're multi-line licensed. So at, we've been talking about rental properties, but I mean, you do, I mean, for, for me and for everybody, you do home, you do auto, you do umbrellas. Um, what other things can you do? So for somebody that's like, well, I got all that, I'm all good, but I like Aaron. What, what else can Aaron do for me? Absolutely. So yes, we handle, uh, you know, autos and, and homes and umbrellas. Uh, we handle life insurance. Uh, we do all kinds of businesses uh, and interrelated policies with those. And so, you know, if you have business autos or, or uh, you need uh, professional liability, um, you know, business umbrellas, workers' compensation, all the, we're full service on, on commercial. Um, and, and we also uh, handle all different kinds of um, recreational. Uh, you know, if you've got the cabin up north or, or the, the big RV or the little pop-up camper, ATV, snowmobiles, dirt bikes, uh, you know, golf carts, you name it. If, uh, if it's a recreational product, we can go ahead and we can find a place to put that in there or get a policy started for it. Um, in addition, uh, I do 
Uh, I do work with people on, on things like uh, health insurance if they're out on the open market looking for coverage. Um, and uh, you know, usually that's my small business owners who um, they, they, they don't have it provided by an employer as, as they're self-employed. And so I can help them to kind of do that. Um, and then I handle some, some very limited um, financial services products, uh, 529 plans, uh, 401ks, 403bs, um, um, you know, the, those kinds of small business type of uh, or, or individual focused uh, financial products. Um, life insurance is probably the thing that I will, you know, and you've seen this, you know, for several years now, I, I talk about it endlessly um, because it, uh, it's, it's probably the most important one that, that nobody uh, really kind of explores. Um, but, but uh, you know, to tie it into your, your uh, landlords, um, you know, they're, they're in a position where they're, they're operating a, a fairly significant, uh, you know, business at that point. You know, they've got a, a big asset and, and requires management and they have tenants and so forth. And if something happens to them, um, you know, are, 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 are there resources in place to make sure that their spouse or, or, or children or whoever's kind of going to end up with this whole package of theirs on their lap? Um, do they have the resources to go ahead and get up to speed and manage it? Um, and, and that's what life insurance does. And so um, those are kind of all the things I do. And so, but, uh, but certainly if, if it's at all, if there's insurance in the title, <laughs> give me a call. And, and, if, and if I can't actually handle it, I, I know somebody who will. So. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. And I just wanted to mention on the life insurance thing, uh, many years ago, I had a partnership with another agent. We owned some duplexes together. And we had an insured by sell. So Kevin owned my policy. I owned his. And that way, when we had our buyout agreement, should one of us die, we, we, have, we would have the money to buy out the other respective spouse. And it was a, a cheap, you know, 10-year term policy. It cost us, a, I don't know, 150 bucks back then, a piece that was very inexpensive. So, yeah, that's... Uh, if people are entering into partnerships in their rental real estate and they want to be able to perform on that without having to liquidate other assets, life insurance takes care of it like that. So absolutely, it, it completely it's, it is absolutely critical. I cannot stress it enough. In a partnership situation, if something happens, it, it it'll allow you to go ahead and maintain your asset. It'll allow you to stay friends with that person's spouse. Right. And, you know, it just makes so many problems go away. And so for partnership yeah. situations, uh, yes, let's talk about a buy sell agreement on a couple of life insurance policies. As you said, the cost is fairly minimal and, uh, you know, it, it's just good. Uh, it's just good business. Absolutely. Well, Aaron, thank you very much for spending the time with me today. Thank um, you, John. You betcha. And I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. And uh, everybody give Aaron a call. Thank you Thanks. very much today. Bye-bye.